One, two, three. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Is it not off? It's um, just coming off. No, mate. Yeah. Switch it on, is it? Switch it on. Hello, darling. Hello, Sue. That's all I can say to you. Just because I'm only allowed ten lines. Hello, darling. Hello, Sue. The weather's fine, the sky is blue. That's because I'm only allowed ten lines. I can't say more, my wrist is sore. It's such an awful strain. I write ten lines again next week, even if it rains. Hello, darling. Hello, Sue. That's all I can say to you. Just because I'm only allowed ten lines. That's where I think it goes. Yes, I November, I November the 17th, didn't I? 1940. And we arrived in Egypt at the end of January. And we were, the, the push was already on. Yeah. You know, this is against the Italians, of course. Yeah, yeah. And we pushed and pushed without any... We didn't have much resistance at all until we got to a place called Ajidabir. Now, we sat there for about two days. This was in, I was in the tank corps, of course. I was a light tank driver in the Royal Tank Corps. And we stayed there for about two days, nothing doing. And for some unknown reason, which we never knew, we were told to retreat. Yeah. And we retreated, as they told us, to a place called Fort McKeeley. Mm -hmm. Now, as we were, for a while, we were on what we call the main road, which would have taken us right back into Cairo. It was a tarmac road and a good road. We got so far along the road and an MP just directed us to this, which was eventually Fort McKeeley. We understand now what we did then, that it was a fifth column. He wasn't a British soldier at all. And yeah. we were turned to there. He was a German. That's it. Yeah. And when we reached McKeeley, it was already been surrounded three days and he just left a gap for us to go in. And as soon as we got in, he just closed the gap. So we were completely surrounded. But we were told by our own officers, who were our officers with us, that all we'd got to do was hang on for 24 hours and our job would be accomplished. Which the idea was to get to Brook ready to defend against his main army when he comes up. Well, instead of lasting for 24 hours, we lasted for five days. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it was the, the Indians were there, and of course the fighting was really terrific, and the bombing. And he sent leaflets down on three occasions, you know, to pack in or else. Yeah. And say on the fifth day, we decided to make a break for it. That was about two thousand of us. Yeah. And we'd no sooner broke, it hadn't happened five minutes, we were captured, and then a sandstorm came. Oh, now, had the sandstorm have come five minutes earlier, yeah. we would probably still, they would never have been captured. Yeah. Because nobody can move when the sandstorm comes. Yeah. It goes just jet black and that's it. Yeah. But of course, that's how fate turned out. We was just captured and that was it. Yeah. I've got a leather jerk on, because as you know, at night time in the desert, it goes very cold. And that was the very first thing as the jerry had off me. It was me jerking. So I got nothing on only a KD shirt. <laughs> So of course, that was it. And I say there was about 2,000 of us then. But we were huddled together on the floor, just in a ring, and surrounded by about two or three lorries and a couple of tanks. Of course, there was such a panic, because everybody could hear the roar, and all thought they were going to be run over by the tanks. Oh, yeah. See, I mean, this is dark at night now. Mm. See, in the middle of the night. And of course, it, it was lorries and tanks that were moving on the outskirts. But of course, you can understand that everybody just been captured and that all the nerves are on edge mm. and there was just panic stations. And we started from there, walking, as I say, and there were four, five lorries at the back. Now, they were full of sentries. Yeah. See, and about four or five sentries walked with us. Well, yeah, how long the queue starts, I don't know. It was seven or eight deep. And as far as you can see, which you very often see on the television or on the pictures, don't we? Mm. Because these sentries only walked for about two hours. Mm. See, and then they got into the lorries and fresh ones got out, so they didn't walk. Right. And it took us 17 weeks to walk from there 
which from Fort McKeeley is about 45 miles in the desert from a place called Durney, yeah. which you've yeah. noticed. Yeah. Now to walk from Durney to Tripoli is about 1,700 miles. It took us 17 weeks. And you walked that? And we walked all the way. And that was sometimes do 20 mile one day. Now all, the, all this is going on, and when we eventually did reach there, the average men that we'd lost was seven a day. See, if anybody dropped down, just couldn't walk anymore, you weren't allowed to stop. Were you walking during the day? Oh yes, when you walk in the daytime. And, and what happened at night? Just aside the road, they just slept down. Okay. Just sat down, see, and the sentry just walked around you. Did anybody try to escape? Oh no, well, you, you hadn't got a ghost of a chance. See, they, they were in no fit state mm. to make a break. So you'd only got the kit that you'd been captured in. Mm. All as I'd got was KD shorts, mm. stockings and shoes, and your old stops as you used to have, mm. and shirt. And no battle dress jacket, that was in my tank, but I'd just got this leather jerkin, mm. see, which is the first thing that Jerry grabbed. Yeah. So you had nothing. Now, you know, when you get in the desert at night, the dew's that heavy, you're just soaking wet. Mm. See, well, in the daytime, then you dry out. Well, of course, it wasn't long, two or three days, ropes had got everything. Mm. They'd got sores coming on the feet, sores coming on the legs, they were lousy, mm. with lice and all the lot. They didn't give you anything to cover, you just... Oh no, no, nothing at all, you just got it, that was it. They just gave you one biscuit a day. Now, to give you the biscuit, it was about an inch thick, and then you had water, a bottle of water. But you couldn't eat the biscuit unless you soaked it. Mm. And you've got to use your bottle of water to soak it. You couldn't bite it, you could only gnaw at it. Mm. And that was all we had. We had what, that every day and a bottle of water, because there was a water cart that travelled with us. Mm. And that's all we had, as I say, and it took us just 17 weeks to reach there. But the total of the officers total of how many men we'd lost, and it worked out an average of about seven a day. But the funny part about it is, and the, all the all the fellas that went with the big fellas, who was the big heavy blokes, the blokes that had been in the guards and other regiments and that, because they're the fellas that just couldn't stand it. They what well, they needed the food, mm. whereas we wanted only wanted little to live. He wanted it three or four times as much, so he must have felt it worse. Yeah. And we were kept in Tripoli for about three days. They were told we were going to be brought across to Wesley on a boat. Three times we were taken down to the docks. No boat. And the third day, the third time we went down, the boat was blazing in the harbour. And we were told that the RAF had bombed it, that the fifth column had got through, that it was to be carried prisoners. So we, ne we never knew. But why we were taken back the previous twice, we don't know. So whether the boat had been skirmished off the coast, we don't know, but we did see this one blazing. Yeah. Eventually we did get brought across. And I got, to, that's right to Naples, of course. And I was taken to a camp called Solmone. It was a camp in the 1418 war. Yeah. Well, it was the oldest prison of war camp they'd got. I got there and that was, uh, it was an officer's compound, of course. And a uh, compound for the British. But there was already some fellas already there. They'd been captured. They were naval blokes. Been captured on a submarine called the Oswald. The only submarine that had been sunk, I think, up to that time. And they were British. There was about 18 of them off the Oswald. They were sailors, of course. Of course, they'd been captured. They had been receiving Red Cross parcels, so we knew that the camp was, like, organised as far as that was concerned. And, of course, we didn't... Uh, we didn't do any actual work there in the fact, in the sense that only for our own benefit, you know, straightening the compound up and doing the garden. We didn't actually go out to work. Mm -hmm. And then one day they came round and asked for volunteers. They wanted 30 for a working party. Well, of course, if you worked, you got 400 grams of bread. When you didn't work, you only got 200, which was only half as much. So obviously everybody volunteered. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 30 of us, well, about 50 of us actually volunteered. And when word come round, I was one of the 30. And we went just outside Rome. Mm -hmm. No, I was, I was about 60 miles from Rome in this particular case, a place called Vitrale, the name is. And we were supposed to be building a prisoner war camp. I went in a stone quarry there. I see there was 30 hours and we slept in these huts. 
and there's a barbed wire around and the camp was right adjoining the barbed wire yeah. where we were actually supposed to be building this camp. I say I went into the stone quarry holding stone out to bring in for the foundations and different lads of course did different departments. It took us I think it was around 18 months to do this but there was one fella, a fella named Albert Penny, he'd been a sailor, he was one of these sailors that was on this Oswald. Mm -hmm. He was volunteered. He was working with a plumber. And every morning the sentry used to come for Albert. See? He used to sign for him and that was it. Now this went on for weeks as they were there, nearly twelve months living in this camp. Went out one morning, but Albert never came back. And he'd escaped and got back to England. And he sent a letter through. Through code because he'd got some fellas there who were his mates. Mm. And he told him by code that he got back to England. What he'd done, he'd gone outside. So he used to do this every morning. Him and the plumber got a bike for biking around to doing the jobs. And they just went out this morning, both of them, and just biked off. See? I mean, the actual Italian knew where he was going. Mm. Albert even more or less helping him to escape because he'd supplied him with money and that, see? Mm. And Albert just cycled right into Buddy Room and went into the Vatican. <laughs> and he just flew him over as the king's messenger. And that was the last we saw of Albert. But as I say, the lads he sent letters through to his mates in the camp. Yeah. We couldn't read it because we couldn't understand it. Yeah. But he'd worked this code out before he'd gone, you know, so we would know. Okay. But he got back and he did say how much money he got. I think it was the news of the world he mentioned uh. how much money they'd given him for his story. Uh. But that's the only fellows I know, as I see, whoever actually got back home. Mm. But Albert worked it. As I say, it took us about 18 months to build this camp, and as soon as we'd built it, oh yes, by then it was 1942, and that was when Tobruk fell. Mm -hmm. And prisoners started to come in the thousands, even British ones, South African and that. And all that they got on as we watched, see, we were in, we were in our own compound. All that they got was just blankets around them, no shoes on, no stockings on. Yet they were British prisoners of war. And well, uh, they'd lost all the kit. Well, of course, our sergeant in charge of us, as I say, there was, was only 30 hours, but we had been captured 12 months, which probably some of us had had two or one clothing parcel, so we'd give them what clothes we'd got. Mm. You know, battle dress, someone would give a jacket or a pair of shoes. Well, these came in for about three days, these prisoners. Say, so I never saw anybody I knew, and none of the land did, but some were British. They no sooner got them in than three days later they started shifting them all out, putting them onto the lorries, out again. So we just couldn't understand this. Next day we were told to pack all the kit up. We were off. It wasn't a prisoner of war camp we'd built at all. It was an army barracks for them. See, now the Red Cross say that you can't, you're not allowed to do things only for your own benefit, so you could build a prison of all camp. Mm. Well, the funny part of it is we got sent to there, and we got sent just outside Rome. You built this for the Italians? Didn't yeah, you? yeah, it was supposed to be for a prison of wars. That's why they brought these prisons of wars in, you see. Yeah. That was all right, but for three days, whip them out again. Oh. We got took then to just outside Rome, Giampino, where the big aer aerodrome is. And we hadn't been there two days, and they'd flattened this camp that we'd just built. The area had flattened it, this army barracks. Which just showed you the fifth column. But we did notice when we were building this that while you were out, fellas had come along to you, which you thought were Italians, and they'd speak to you in perfect English. Mm. How are you, Johnny, this morning and all that, see? Well, you were the Italians knew English well. Mm. But it made you think, well, you started to think this out afterwards. What they were, they were Englishmen, you see. Mm. You know, spies kind of stuff. And that's what happened, they completely flattened the camp, there wasn't a thing left. So they hadn't gained anything mm. by us building it and then shifting us out. Mm. So as I say, we're in Rome, when we started, we were building houses then, or flats as you'd call them now, upstairs and down. And that was a quite a steady job there, because on a Sunday afternoon, if we weren't working, the centre just to get us out in 20s and 30s. See, there's 30 hour, 20 or 30 hour, we could all go, or 20 ago, or 30 could go. And used to go walk around Rome. This was, this was only about a mile, a mile and a half down the road, mm. which was 
quite very much a change from the other place. You know, you, you, you can look forward to something. Who are these houses while you're working? Oh, they were for civilians. Civilians? You're oh, allowed yeah. to do that? Oh, yeah. We're allowed to do that, apparently. Oh. Which we don't know. So you, you're not supposed to do these things, but yes. there you are. But you did it. Mm. Because we had to get we got searched every morning as we went out. Oh. And of course, search when we came back at night. It didn't stop me getting my watch, mind you, although I got searched. Yes. I gave doings for that. Three pair of long pants and three <laughs> pair of woolen vests. See, the Italians apparently couldn't get clothing. From an Italian? Yeah, they couldn't get clothing at all, but of course they got plenty of money. They could buy watches. Mm. So, of course, I used to go out in the morning at six o'clock. We used to work, see, till about half past five, six o'clock at night. Mm. So I got talking to this Italian senior, we should up and get you to watch if we can get him some clothing. Well, I knew I don't wear long pants. Well, <laughs> mother had sent them in a clothing parcel. Yeah. I put these three pair of long pants on and put the three vests on. I looked about 14 stone. I was absolutely boiling up because, as I say, you don't go, all you don't work in the morning was your shorts mm. and your shoes and your carriage jacket over your arm. Mm used to be handy for putting bread in if you brought any bread back, see? <laughs> but of course, I had to go on with all these vests on. But nobody ever guessed nothing. And when I got to work, of course, I just got into one of the buildings, took these off and gave them, and he gave me the watch. And it hasn't cost me eight, and yes, it's since. Only to have it cleaned, and the winder wore out, didn't it? The winder wore down with the winder, I had to have a new winder on. So that's 30 years, so that owes me nothing. <laughs> when you weighed up with three long pants and three vests, Mm. I would say that was all right with that. As I say, we worked there for... Oh. Worked there for about 18 months. And then, of course, that was when the Italians packed in. Mm. They packed in then there. Well, the sentries just went. What happened? We just, to, well, to you were working the, on this? We did, we did the news through various sources, Italian, you see, you'd tell you different things, that the yeah. war was going bad with them, mm -hmm. and all this, that, and the other. And apparently there was some argument between the German military and the Italian military with Mussolini, we just don't, couldn't, get, we could never get the truth. Mm. Well, for no some reason, this particular morning you got up and there just wasn't any sentries there. Yeah. I mean, one or two of the lads just walked out the gate, but everybody was a bit dubious. Where are they? What, what is going on? Are they going to shoot or something like that, you see? But nobody just came, so we just walked out. Now we went out and there was about 13 of us that stuck together. Yeah. And we went into an orchard. So what we used to do there, we used to sleep, as I say, in the daytime. And then at night time, go up into the village and pinch bread and stuff like that. And we'd done this for three or four nights. No trouble at all. Outside the camp? Oh yes, quite a distance what? from the country, never had no trouble at all. We just came down this one particular morning, loaded up because we had nothing but bread and grapes. Well, we hadn't been able to get any bread for a couple of days, we were eating nothing but grapes. Well, of course, if you need a toilet, you were living on the toilet, yeah. you were coming out ready bagged. <laughs> yeah. So, because we came down, we came down there, the paratroopers were standing where we'd been sleeping, must have watched us for days and never let on at all. With the rifles across us, just waiting for us to come back. Of course, we had no choice, that was it. We'd been cornered. As I say, we'd been, been away for three, five days then. Well, we got took there and put into these, as I say, like railway coaches, they like horse boxes. You got a little grill at the sign. Mm. Of course, when the trains were in, there was dozens of prisoners on. We must have been gathering these prisoners up from all over the place. The train was full, and they had to put about 40 of us in each one, and then just shut the door. But, of course, the door got locked. Yeah. Well, of course, they opened it once every night, as I say. Well, of course, the lads were doing it in the mess tins, and what, whatever they'd got, they were doing the dirt and everything, and the place just stunk vile. Yeah. But the amazing part about it was we got took, as I say, into Germany. But when we were going through the Brenner Pass, we happened to stop there just to go to the toilet. Because we'd got in boiling hot summer, which an Italian summer is. Mm. When we got out there, snow-capped mountains, snow everywhere. It was just amazing because, I mean, it's dark inside. When we got the light coming through the grill, 
And that was just the amazing part. But you hadn't got a chance of escaping in the mountains. You wouldn't know where you were. Yeah. Yeah. Because as I say, we were on there for five days and five nights. That's when we got to, to Muleberg, of course. And like I say, when we got there, that we got all nationalities and they'd been gathering them up, no doubt, from all over the place. And then they asked, uh, we hadn't been there long when they started to sort you out. Who wants to work? She sought the English out from the Poles and the Czechs and the Russians. And he wanted a working party. Of course, as soon as they had a working party, I volunteered. I was there again. And uh, why did I go then? Oh, they wanted a, a 40 to go to a place called, I think it's in the, in, in the book there, Reichenbach. I went to and I worked on the railway. We had a re I had a really good job, because by this time now my brother was captured. He got captured in 1942. Because mm. he's no longer with us, is he? He only died yeah, yeah. a few years ago. So I went to work on the railway there. Well, of course, we all got different jobs. Some worked in a meat factory. We actually s slept on a wooden hut, a side of the railway. Uh, that really belong did belong to the railway, really. And we only had one officer and one sentry. So he went, of course, some words to say in this meat factory. Five of us worked on the railway. We'd all got different firms to go to. It was a permanent job, like, for good. Mm. You know, as long as the war lasted, that was it. We were just put there, I think, and forgotten. This officer, he, he thought he'd got a good cushion on, but we just one sentry. Because it was just, it was holiday for him, they got no trouble. Mm. See, half the time, the people who we worked for just came up to the hut in the morning signed for us, we went with them, the sentry didn't have to go with us. We were more or less like on a type of parole. Mm. You know, no sentry went with you. And I was on the railway, to say, a really good number. The lads used to load the wagon, it's just like working on the LMS goods here. Mm. Like in a big warehouse and a side in the railway wagon comes in. Mm. And of course you load all the stuff in. And all I had to do was stand at the door. After we'd done it a week or two, see, they put one of us in charge and it happened to fall onto me. Just stand at the door and check all these things off that were in. Mm. As soon as I got them all in, just lock the door and seal it up with a lead seal, mm. see, and then just wait for the engine to come and tow it out. Mm. Because this was just working now. I mean, say there was a, they'd got a canteen in there, but mind there was never any food. They, they just for them to eat. They brought their own food, of course. And then the phone went this one day. Said her, her Venkel was wanted. That was me. Well, I go to the phone. When I went to the phone, it was the officer from the camp, from the place where we slept. Would I come up, come back right away? My brother had put in for me. See, now I tried for two years to put in for him. See, but it's same as in the army. The older man gets the preference, mm. so they wouldn't let him come to me. But as soon as he put the claim in, I have to go to him. Of course, I guess, the idea goes out and travels for about three days, I think it was, with a sentry. He had to take me there. Of course, when I get there, he's in a camp. There's about 3,000 in it. They all work at a paper factory, which is across the road. This is in a place called Swickow. See, Leonard's the name of the factory was, paper factory. He's the camp hairdresser, but nobody ever has a bloody haircut. Because <laughs> they're out all day. See what I mean? When they come home at night, that's it. So he's got a bobby's job. And there he's took me from a camp <laughs> where I got a bobby's job, and he now I'm stung with him. You could do this, could you, in the war? That if, if you had relations, they would try to put you... Oh, yes, the yeah, see, they, they they apparently they have got the same belief. The, the British, see, you say the same in the British Army. The elder one can claim, the younger one, See? Of course, I put in there two or three times, oh yes, we'll get him with you. Never yeah. happened. Yeah. Yet as soon as I would put in, I was gone. See? Yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> well, I didn't, when I got to the camp and saw this, I thought, well, hell, I don't want this. Yeah. But I could have had no choice. Yeah, See, I've got a nice cushy number there, no trouble at all, regular job, no work. I mean, I'd done all my grafting mm. the two years previous. Now I've got to start again. Of course, when I get here, of course, my brother's well known in this camp, and of course, it was a proper joke for days, see, he's Wink's brother, as they called it. 
And I went working in this paper factory across the way there, taking, unloading logs off a, you know, as the trains come in or as the lorries come in, unloading logs. But they used to put us two stakes in the ground. It all depends on which wood was on that wagon. Mm -hmm. You know, what weight in wood, I suppose, in their eyes. And whatever weight was in, they used to put a stake in the ground, then a stake a certain distance away. You knew you'd got to stack it in between that. Mm. See what I mean? Now, the more wood there was, they might worn it out a little bit. But it meant that you'd got to go as much as eight and nine feet high with this temper. See what I mean? So mm. one lad had got to leave it up to another, which was really hard work. Yeah. And of course, there was a saw there which they had to saw it up because all this eventually went into the factory and got crushed to make paper of. Yeah. So, and of course, some of the lads had to dig it out of these pits when it was set have planks across and cut it and dig it out with shovels. Yeah. And I was actually, this is at the camp I was at, really, when the bombing really got serious. You know, we could more or less tell then that we were winning the war because you couldn't get any truth. The Jerry's were always, they were winning it. You see, now at this particular camp where I'm saying now where we worked, one of the lads had made a key to fit one of the doors and there's two or three used to take it in turns to get out of the camp. They had a section of the wire cut which they could bend back and get out and pull it to. See, well, they only got to nip down like a country road and then right opposite was the factory. Yeah. Once they watched that that sentry had gone past, they knew that we three or four minutes before he came back again because he's got us two certain points to reach. Mm. And of course, they used to get into the firm which has made this duplicate key for the canteen across the road. As I say, it was a canteen. There was a wireless and there was never any food in. It was a canteen just for sitting down and eating your own food which you'd taken. And he used to get the BBC radio on and get the news. So we did more or less know where our troops were advancing. Mm. And he used to, used to bring this back next morning and pin it on the notice board, see? But make certain that it was whipped off quick when yeah. one of the officers come round. Yeah. Because that's how we used to get the information. And of course, as I say, we've been working across this fact to them for some unknown reason, as I say, they never told us. We just got to pack in work. So there was no work. Not going out, of course, at all. Mm. Then they started bombing in Swickow itself. There was a hell of a lot of marshalling yards there, same as crew. You know, a lot of unloading. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they flattened this this day. Oh, they wanted us out on working party there. Because we had to go down there and dig in bodies out and all that cable, which is a job that we shouldn't do any case. Mm. See? Of course, one of the lads didn't dig many out. They buried plenty, but didn't dig many. Them as weren't gone. Mm. The lads finished off. As I say, this happened over four or five days, but th it was nothing to see. Eighty or ninety bombers at a time, and just as that wave's gone over another eighty or ninety, you were spending ninety percent of your day in shelters because mm. we did we say we could hear the gunfire so everybody thought well things must be getting it must be getting really close then they stopped us going there mm. see we could oh no we couldn't go out on digging these bodies out so we thought well things must be really getting close as i say we got the panic on because we thought these fellas are guarding us these volkstrom or as we'd call it the it's a Volkstrom in their language, and he would call the own guard. We thought they'll panic, they will. They're quite apt to put a couple of hand grenades in the camp and blow it up and be off. See, I was to say, so many of us went on, the same as them. The first night they did pick the staff. That was the hairdresser and the cook and all that. See, my brother was in this effort. Mm. Of course, nothing at all happened the first night. No trouble. They had no trouble. They hadn't heard no gunfire. They did nothing. As I say, the next night, we weren't working, they'd stopped us from working, so we said, all right, oh, we'll volunteer. And I happened to be one of them who volunteered. As I say, we played cards till about four o'clock in the morning with these sentries, because they like to play snap. Mm. You know, we played snap with them. As I say, it was getting time for about six o'clock, so of course, we just leaves and goes back. As I say, we're just on the way back, and the phone went to the British... They wanted the British Army officers. 
There's this fellow talking in English, and it was from the camp just down the road, as had been released, mm. and told us to get ready, it wouldn't be many minutes. So you could just imagine, you wake all the lads up, and tell them as they've been freed, well, there's pandemonium. Mm. They were jumping over beds and on beds, and taking this and taking that. As I say, everybody was getting loaded up. I've got a new pair of shoes, I thought, I'm not taking them. <laughs> but I'm not walking in them, so I give them away. Mm. So they must have already crippled somebody. <laughs> but I want to get wear them. As I say, I was just amazed when these fellas came in the in the yard. Because oh. it was like an old factory where we actually slept. You know, the old fashioned mill type. Yeah. Eight or nine stories high, it was that type of a building. But when they came in, they just didn't look as if they could catch anything. And as I say, I think ten British soldiers had wiped the lot out if they'd have had any will to fight, but these fellas just didn't want to fight. They'd had enough of the war and that was it. Mm. As I say to me, there was about 30 blokes that came in, infantry. Two, two American officers in jeeps, and they just said that was it, and they just laid down their arms. And just told us where to start walking and that was it. So we didn't ask no questions. But as we walked along the road, you could see the infantry coming down. But it was, just, it was only a forward patrol. It was, they'd only got the rifles with them, and that was it. Mm. I mean, I reckon the own guard that they had there <laughs> would have got rid of them if they'd yeah. had any will to fight. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, from then, as I say, we had to start walking it. That's when we started to walk the five days. But the first night, as I say, we headed for this place called Geary. When we got there, we walked down the street, and all the windows had all got bullet holes in. And then it was the Yanks, these infantry that released us. And as they went through, the Yanks were just riding on the top of the jeeps and shooting, cowboy fashion, just shooting anywhere. And say, so when we got there, we, we, we slept in a best night's tip I've had things of it since I've been a prisoner of war. Mm. We slept in a blanket factory. <laughs> We'd all got about nine or ten new blankets <laughs> underneath us. We didn't bother to roll them, we just slept them as they were, just rolled up. Yeah. But we did have a good night to get there. And so then we started off again next morning for that place called Grimmy Show, and that was about another 25 mile. Because mm. I say after about two days, the lads, they've got no shoes left, they're walking in the bare feet. What are you eating on at this time? Or I say, well, the, the Yanks. Oh, the Yanks. Oh, the Yanks. Oh, as soon as the third out, these came yeah. into the compound, yeah. they gave us food. Yeah. Chief, have you seen any Americans? He said, you, you have one of these papers up, and they'll be all right. Oh. But we say we didn't fare too grand, because you never knew when you were going to bump across some Yanks mm. until we reached the, about the third night stay. Mm. And this was quite a big town, as the Yanks had captured. And the sentry told us, you go up to the headquarters up the road and have an interview with the American officer. And that's when we went up there. And of course, when we told him who we were, we were prisoners of war, and the camp that we'd come from, you know, at Swickow, he says, oh, you've never come that far. As I say, the only one who just happened to save his army pay book, which was good enough proof. And he gave us a permit then. They say that anywhere that we went, we must have petrol, see, food and cigarettes. And we never had no trouble from then on. Every camp that we come across, as I say, but we always made certain we kept away from the British. We wanted nothing to do with them. But they they still had us in Germany now working. We wouldn't be home yet. <laughs> Not with the British. Yeah. And you went, and then at the end of the five days, you got to. Yes, we were, we went to the RTO, Ra Railway Transport Officer in Lyall, and he uh, rode us over by boat. And I got to, to a camp in the south of England. Hmm. Kept there for about two days, fitted out with fresh kit, then I sent to him. But I was also sent to him to say, same time as my brother, and he never went back in. Mm. He was given indefinite leave, yet I had seven weeks leave and had to go back in the army. And I did all my army training all over again, right from rock bottom. And I did another 12 months in the army, didn't I? Yeah, another 12 months in the army. What's done, yeah. 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 I went back in, did the owl? No. Finished. Uh, what was Fort McKinney like? Oh, it was a it was a good fort. It was a good e emplacement for the job, what it was for. But what it had been in the original, I just don't know. 
but the Italians had used it, yeah. you know, as a military depot. I just don't know. But, but how, the, how the Indians come to be there, I don't know. Unless they'd been sent there on the same assumption as us. Was it the British that had the place, Fort McKinley? Well, no, there's no British there. There's only, the, only the Indians there. Oh, the Indians? Yeah, the Indians right. were there when we got there. Mm. You know, the Sikhs with all the turbans yeah. on. Yeah. But why they ever got there, I just don't know. What had it been? I don't know. And you were fighting, you were, you were sort of fighting in there. We were fighting you? there for five days. Fighting yeah. five days, oh, yeah. yeah. You just were surrounded and they started, they yes. opened up. Who's bombing and artillery and all that. Yeah. And they dropped leaflets. And it was, what, 24 hours fighting all the time? Oh well, yes, he was on all the time, in the night as well, yeah. Oh. oh yes, for five days it lasted. And then you broke out at night? No, morning. In the morning? Just about in the morning, run, and the run, no run. sooner, mm. been captured, and the sandstorm came up. Yeah, so you got out, and they surrounded you. Oh yes, we say we covered probably about two or three hundred yards, but we hadn't got much chance then. No, no, good. Uh, now, um, a PG-59, you, you you were there. How long were you PG-59? About 16 months. Uh, is, could you tell us something about uh, about it, the sort of routine and the, the things yeah. that one did and any incidences that you can remember there? No. Yeah, I can't remember anything particularly. There's a working camp there. I worked there, of course. Mm -hmm. work. See, some camps were non-working camps, yeah. but some were a working camp. And that was a working camp there, of course. This is where you could um, please yourself if you worked. You were, this oh, was yeah. volunteers, That's and you right. went out and you got... Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. As I say, there had been a prisoner of war camp in the last war, hadn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one at Sulmona. Which you did have a choice, but of course, obviously, everybody wanted to work. Mm. Otherwise, you only got 200 grams of bread if you didn't. Mm. 400 if you did, but well, it was just twice as much. Yeah. What What did you do at uh, at at um, you went out working? What was it? A 12-hour day? Or something? It all depends what particular camp. There it wasn't. There you went out eight, so I had four, half past four. And what was your sort of day? What was it? A day that you you went out at eight. You got up in the morning. What time did you get up in the morning? Oh, this particular camp. Oh, yeah, six o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock. Oh, right, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, what? Yeah. Um, what was the food like and things like? That? Well, of course, you, you you have your bread ration. You have your bread ration in the morning. Mm. At your two hundred grams of bread. Now you don't have anything else in the day, John. Yeah. But when you come home at night, you have what they call soup. Yeah. But you can never find anything in it. It's water and things floating about. Yeah. And bits of lentils and all that. But you never see any potatoes or vegetables as we know it. Yeah. yeah. So what you used to do, you used to eat your bread before you went to work. Come home at night and you had that. Yeah. Then you either went to bed or you sat down and read, read books. You read books? It was a library or something? Well, you either read books. Well, the lads got different parcels through, you see. Yeah. Some got books in. And this is all after a while. I mean, if you start off with, you have nothing to read. Yeah. See? You allow parcels then and things. Oh, yes, you get a clothing parcel every three months. Yeah. They send from England every three months. Mm. But sometimes it takes six months to come through. Mm. How many of you in a billet or in a, in, a, in a... Well, we were in wooden huts there. Yeah. It was about 40 in each one. Yeah. And there was about seven on each side of, each co of, the, of the compound. And then one at the top. We used to play football in the centre. Mm. And we had time because the huts were at the side. Mm. And we had one room that we used, we made eventually for a concert room, but a stage at the far end. But so as you've been captured a while, you see, you start to get instruments through, yeah. through the Red Cross and that. Yeah. And we had a little band fixed up. Yeah. Used to have dances and that caper, yeah. you know, amongst the cells. Yeah. See, that's where that Italian got shot there. That Englishman got shot there. Yeah. And Danny Corbett. That was on. That was the day after Boxing Day. Yeah. It was Boxing Day. It was the twenty sixth. That was. That was in Solmona camp. Um, and um, what did you do at night, sort of thing? Sing songs and things. And Sing songs. I mean, I just made dark wood. Yeah. Used to make a dark wood out of a round piece of wood. Yeah. And make a dark out of a nail. Uh 
Uh-huh. We'd fly to him. Yeah. Improvise with things like that, you know. Yeah. What about escapes? Anybody try to escape there? It's so lonely, yes, as we've had quite a few escape, uh, mainly officers. Yeah. They started the escape, but I don't think ever one was successful. No. Yeah. You know, used to dig the, dig the tunnels, and before they ever reached the outside, somebody had given way, and we always think that they always put an informer in the compound, which yeah. you never knew which was. Yeah. And, and this was all run by Italians at the camp? This it? was, oh yes, that was all Italians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, could you tell us this this poem of yours? This one about Fort Makeda. Yeah. Um, did you write that, or it was written? Oh, well, about three hours wrote that. All made words up, and made lines up, and fixed it all up. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely true, is it? This. Yes. Yeah. It is. There's one to the end, isn't there? At the yeah, Keeley. And then there's the other one. Yeah. Mm. The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, uh, are there any other uh, sort of incidences that, uh, you know, during the whole period that you think that stand out? Yeah. I just start thinking back at me now as to what happened. You know, to, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. You met the Pope? Yeah. Oh, well, the Pope came round. That was when we were at uh, Rome, that was. Mm -hmm. Pope Pius, what was it, 12th, was it? I don't know. I, don't know. I forget the numbers of these Popes. <laughs> yeah. But that's when we were building the houses in Rome. They came round. But the Pope yeah. came round one Sunday yeah. afternoon. Uh, mm. Shook hands with us all, didn't he? He knew you were prisoners of war. Oh, yes, yes. I suppose it was a special invite for him, you know, mm. from the Italian side of it. Yeah. They just said the Pope's coming round. And just came round and shook hands with us all. Yeah. Uh, but um, apart, uh, you know, you seem to have got through it, um, sort of with with limbs and with all you know, with all your faculties and everything. I mean, it, it wasn't experience. You could have done without it, but. Oh yes, well, there's anything that got you from it. You just got to make the best of it. See, when I was captured, I was 11 stone. Oh. Now, when I came home, I was 6 stone 2. 6 stone 2. 6 stone 2. So you only had, as I say, you only had this 200 grams of bread, which you did 12 hours a day actual work. Yeah. See, when I worked in that stone quarry, it was 6 o'clock in the morning, yeah. and we were building the camp, yeah. which is supposed to have been a camp for ourselves. I did 12 hours a day. Now you only had 200 grams of bread, which is about as big as a Berlin bun in the sense of it. Yeah. How was it you were called back after being in prison war for that time? How was it they called you back into the army? Because the group number hadn't come up. Didn't No consideration of me being a prisoner of war. See, he was older than me, my brother was. Yeah. And they didn't think that when we came home that it was worth having him back in the army for. Yes, but I mean, weren't prisoner of war automatically given time to sort of recuperate? Mm -hmm. or seven no, weeks. Well, they, they send them to what they call a rehabilitation. Seven weeks I was given, then I was sent to a camp at, at Sudbury. Sudbury. Yeah, well, that was only for a while, then I went right back in the army. Oh, yes. Of and where did you go yeah. then? Didn't I? Mm -hmm. Did you have to go abroad again? Oh, no. Oh, no. no, oh, no. no. Oh, it was in England. Yeah. Yeah. And you were demobbed after the war, when the war was over. Was the war over? Just to be out there, wasn't it? 1945. May 45. Did you come out in April? Yeah, I think just, just before. Just before. Just before the war finished, my group number came up 26. Mm. And I was group number 26. Mm. Uh, actually, I got sent to Barnard Castle. No. I did 12 months well, training. Did, did you ever try yourself to escape or you just thought, well, there's no point to just get on... Well, the I say we escaped from this up. place when they picked us up in Italy. Yeah, was in the, there was no use. Yeah. We'd never any yeah. chance, that any of us then, of actually getting home. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you were all surrounded by mountains. Yeah. So what what about, um, did you do any sabotaging or anything like that or just to do the, do the job? Oh, at work you did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, so on, what on, sort of things did you use? Yeah. Oh, the lads used to cut things open in these railway wagons and pinch stuff. Yeah. We used to, at one time, we used to load hundreds of tons and 
crates of custard powder and blue mange powder. Mm. Well, the lads were having blue mange forever at night. <laughs> We'd been in this small camp with only an officer and one soldier. Yeah. So we had a little kitchen, a little stove. Because well, when we had Red Cross Park, you see, we, we could yeah. utilise it. Yeah. You know what I mean? What well, about this camp that your brother was on? Was that quite a... But that was well. That wasn't such a cushy number. What was the camp like there? Was there strict discipline there, or was the commandant all right or what? Where was this? The, 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 the way your brother was uh, ahead. Oh, and um, oh, the officer himself, he was no good at all. No. But why did you get in the army, in the British army? You've got some rows of men. Mm. I mean, some of the army sergeants, mm. I fear the worst what they would be like, over prisoners of war, mm. because they rot as over Englishmen. Mm. So, I mean, you've got, you've got to look at it this sense when you're a prisoner of war. Yeah. At least I always did. Mm. After all, they'd have been doing a job which they've been told they've got to do. Yeah. And they say, I mean, you can't blame them. Yeah. I mean, you've got the odd individual sentry, yeah. you know, who'd clout you, with, the, clout you with, the, uh, with his butt of his rifle and all that, yeah. which they did do if you were at work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you get the odd bloke that's awkward, you know, try to let back, well the Italian doesn't know what you're saying, so he's just just pretty clout him. Mm. Well I mean you just have to think, don't you? Mm. And use your common sense. Yeah. I I mean, the Germans were better well these things you. happen. But I reckon the, the Jerry Italians, right? Well he's a he's a gentleman in my opinion. He's a soldier. Mm. He's professional. But I mean he's doing his job and he can do his job well. Mm. And I think they used to respect the English and we used to respect them. Yeah. But nobody got any respect for the Italian. Yeah. And they were just no good. They didn't want to fight. They couldn't fight if they wanted. Yeah. And all they wanted to do was run. Mm. I've no time for the Italians at all. Yeah. I mean, the Jerry to me, he is, he is a gentleman. He's a good soldier. I mean, you do get good officers and you do get bad ones. But I always think that they, they're doing the job well. You couldn't very well make a prisoner of war's job very cushy, could you? Not really. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's there, well, they don't even right. make an army an army man's job comfortable. They can't even make a prisoner. <laughs> it just comes out of it, Mike. Hmm? 